Hello and welcome to the Third Street Center. My name is Erin Riccio and I'm the Director of Community Organizing with Wilderness Workshop. Uh, before we begin tonight's presentation, I do want to start by doing a land acknowledgement, particularly because we will be talking about our public lands in this presentation. So I want to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands of the Ute people who have stewarded this area for generations. So each winter, Wilderness Workshop partners with the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies and the Roaring Fork Audubon to co-host Naturalist Nights, a free winter speaker series that features experts from across the country who explore different topics of the natural world of our community. So tonight's talk is the fourth of our five Naturalist Nights presentations. Presentations take place every other week from January to March at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays in the Third Street Center in Carbondale and Thursdays at ACES, Hallam Lake, and Aspen. So it's been a little bit of an unconventional year for us, as you probably have known. And so a lot of these uh, have taken place over Zoom, but we're really excited that we are here for the first time at the Carbondale location, back together as a community for tonight's presentation. Before we begin, I want to make sure to call out our awesome sponsors who've made tonight possible. So we have some gold level sponsors, Reese Henry, Aspen Ski Co., Clark's Market, Craig Ward, Ken Ransford, and our silver level sponsors, the Village Smithy, Aspen Square, Ute Mountaineer, Blazing Adventures, Cripple Creek Backcountry, Bristlecone Mountain Sports, Two Leaves in a Bud, and Bonfire Coffee. So that was a lot of names for me to get through. So clearly we have a lot of awesome community support for this. Um, all of these have a premier sponsor. Um, so the person who is doing that tonight is Haymax. So a big shout out to Haymax. So all of these businesses provide financial and in-kind donations to make this event series possible. Grassroots TV is live streaming tonight's presentation on their website, but folks can also tune in on Wilderness Workshop and ACES Facebook pages and YouTube channels. So for people who aren't able to attend tonight or aren't able to tune into the live stream, we will have a cleaned up recording of tonight's event that will be made available on our organization's YouTube channel in the coming days. Just keep your eye out for an email from Wilderness Workshop on that. So I want to preview our next Naturalist Night and final Naturalist Night presentation of this series, which will be Three Billion Birds Lost by Arvind Punjabi with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And that will be in two weeks on Wednesday, March 9th here at the Third Street Center and March 10th at Hallam Lake in Aspen. And now I'm super excited to introduce tonight's speaker, Hilary Boyd. Now in her new role as the Assistant Field Manager for Resources, Hillary previously worked as a wildlife biologist at the Bureau of Land Management's Colorado River Valley Field Office in Silt for over seven years and has been a resident of the area for over 15 years. She enjoys planning habitat projects that benefit greater sage grouse, mule deer and elk and other wildlife species. She's worked as a BLM fire ecologist, habitat specialist for the Arizona Game and Fish Department and seasonally for the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and the U.S. Fish and Game Service. Some of her best adventures are from her time managing grizzlies and humans in Katmai and Denali National Parks up in Alaska and working in other remote parts of the state. She's earned a B.S. and M.S. in wildlife biology from Colorado State University and the University of Arizona. Tonight, she's going to share with us how land managers and others have been using an old tool in a new way. Specifically, how the agency has been using goats to help restore and protect wildlife habitats in the Roaring Fork Valley. Thank you so much, Hillary, for being with us tonight. And I do want to just have a reminder to all of you to please hold your questions until the end. We will do a little bit of a Q&A session. I'm going to turn it over to Hillary. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Erin, for the introduction. Thank you, Wilderness Workshop, for inviting me to speak tonight. Thank you to all of you for coming out on a really cold and snowy evening. And um, thanks to people who are viewing this presentation virtually. Um, let's see, I'm gonna talk this evening about some of the ways that uh, the BLM Colorado River Valley Field Office has been, have been using goats as a tool for habitat restoration. Let me see if I can operate this. So I'm going to start out with just a really brief background about the BLM. I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about goats, and then we're going to talk about some of the different types of projects we've been doing and different resource uh, objectives that we're trying to achieve. All right, so BLM manages a lot of land in the United States. And uh, as someone who's been a wildlife biologist for many years with the BLM, one of my very favorite things is that we manage more wildlife habitat than any other agency. 
Uh, in Colorado, we manage 8.3 million acres of surface. Um, if you think about uh, the way the Forest Service and the BLM got started, in general, uh, for the forest tend uh, the Forest Service manages higher elevation lands, and that's because the Forest Service was set up to uh, protect and manage timber resources. And so those forest systems are generally at higher elevation. Um, the BLM manages a lot of lands that were left over after the Homestead Act. We manage a lot of lower elevation lands, a lot of um, sagebrush shrublands, uh, pinyon juniper woodlands, uh, other mountain shrublands. And uh, you know, at the time, once upon a time, those lands maybe uh, weren't thought to have a lot of value, but I think more and more as time goes on, we're understanding just how important uh, these landscapes are for sagebrush obligate species like greater sage grouse and for providing winter really important winter habitat for deer, elk, and a lot of other species as well. Um, this is a map of Colorado. The yellow is BLM. And um, I have this up here just to illustrate that most BLM lands in Colorado are in the western part of the state. This area, let me see if you can see my cursor. This is the upper Colorado River District. Our field office, the Colorado River Valley field office is right here. And this is um, the Grand Junction field office. Um, it's a little hard to see this brown outline, but this is the boundary of our field office. And I have this map up here to see kind of the mixed land ownership of, of, of the landscape. So green is Forest Service, yellow is BLM, and white is private. And Carbondale is right down, right down around here. So some of the mixed land ownership um, can create challenges and, and also a lot of really good opportunities. Um, our mission is to, sustain the health, is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of public lands for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. And I take that mission to heart whenever I'm planning wildlife habitat projects. Um, BLM is a multiple, a multiple use agency, just as the Forest Service is. We manage for wildlife habitat, but many other resources as well. So now I wanna transition into talking about goats. And um, I always like to remember that the human history of working with goats goes way, way back. Probably um, sometime 10 to 11,000 years ago, um, Neolithic farmers in the Middle East and Western Asia started keeping small herds of um, Bazur ibex. Uh, they kept these animals for their, for their meat and for their milk, for their skin and fur for clothing and for building. They use their dung for fires. Um, since that time, there probably been, there have been um, additional, peer, uh, I guess, more recent periods of domestication and the goats that we see today and that we think of today may be the result of some more recent periods of domestication. But um, my point and message is that people have been working with goats for a really, really long time. And this illustration here from the late 1800s, it says a uh, bazir goat, but um, that's a lot what the, the wild ibex look like. So fast forward about 10,000 years to today, we've got over 300 breeds of goats that have been uh, selected for a variety of purposes. Uh, goats are probably the most adaptable and geographically widespread type of livestock. Um, I think it's important to point out goats are browsers and sheep are grazers. So goats really like to eat things at eye level or a little bit above their heads or sometimes way up above their heads. They'll stand up on their hind legs sometimes and reach up as high into the brush and trees as they can reach. Um, but they'll eat whatever's available. So if there isn't browse available, they'll, they'll eat grasses and, and forbs. So um, the contractor that we've worked with the last two years, Lonnie Malberg, who owns Goat Green LLC, uses um, cashmere goats. Cashmere isn't actually um, a, a specific breed, but that variety of goat uh, was, uh, I guess, was bred in the Himalayas. They're adapted to high elevation and cold climate, so they do really well in the Rocky Mountains. And um, they also have amazing, amazing hair. Let me get, uh, which make lovely sweaters. Okay, so this brings us to, um, the way, you know, I, I just love that for, for thousands of years, humans have worked with goats, and now we're starting to um, 
think of some new and innovative ways to use them to help us meet other objectives. And so at the CRV, we have been using short-term high-intensity goat grazing to manage weeds without chemicals. I think that is the objective that people think of the most. Um, Raft has been using goats to manage weeds along the Rio Grande Trail for many years, and a lot of municipalities are using goats more and more to control weeds, and also to uh, reduce fuel loads to minimize the chance of spread of wildfire. Um, we're using goats to rebuild soils. Um, I'm really excited that we're gonna be using goats to uh, maintain a prescribed burn, and also some mechanical treatments that we've done. Uh, we're using them to manage Gamble Oak and other mountain shrub communities, and to restore some former agricultural fields. So, goats eat weeds. If you Google goats eat weeds, you'll find um, Lonnie Malmberg's website, and there's a lot of really great information if you'd like to learn more about her operation. But um, the way it usually works, if you turn out some goats in a field, they usually start by biting the flowers off of whatever plants are there, and then they'll come through and they'll pick the individual leaves off the stalks, and they may or may not eat the stalks depending on how hungry they are and how palatable those stalks are. But by removing the seed heads, they're making, or the flowers, they um, are eliminating that, eliminating that plant's ability to produce seeds. By removing the leaves, they're reducing the plant's ability to photosynthesize which really impacts um, the viability of the root system. Goats chew their food and they digest their food really well. So they crush a lot of seeds with their teeth while they're eating. And um, I'm not saying there isn't an occasional seed that might pass through a goat and be viable. Um, most of the time, seeds are no longer viable after passing through a goat. Um, in contrast to birds and a lot of other animals that have co-evolved with plants, and you know, in some cases it's actually advantageous to plants for an animal to spread those seeds, or if you think about a horse that doesn't digest its food that well, and a lot of times seeds that pass through a horse are still viable. Um, and goats can help build, rebuild soil. So one of the things I really like about using goats to control weeds is they're removing the weeds, but they're also improving soil conditions to hopefully make, um, I guess, increase the chances you're gonna be supporting the plants that you wanna have growing there. Um, this is just a really short list of some of the undesirable plants that goats will eat. Um, they eat noxious weeds. They can eat a lot of plants that are noxious to other types of livestock. Lonnie says that the mama goats pass on their ability to eat different kinds of plants to their babies. And she's been raising her goats for over 20 years. She's on something like her 25th or 26th generation of goats. And because she, she calls herself a gypsy, she moves all over the West year round um, doing different types of restoration projects. So her goats have been exposed to just about every plant that grows in the West which I think is pretty amazing. So anyone who uh, was around the summer of 2018 remembers the late Christine fire. Um, it started in July of 2018. It burned over 12,500 acres. This isn't a final fire map, but it's pretty close to it. And the reason I have it up here is just a reminder that the majority of the area that was burned was on the forest. Uh, the blue is the state wildlife area. A lot of the state wildlife area burned and about a thousand acres of BLM burned. And I'm gonna be talking about the BLM portion. So the year after the fire in 2019, we noticed that we were getting um, a really big infestation of plumeless thistle. Plumeless thistle is a really nasty, noxious weed. It grows quite tall, it's really prickly, it will take over. And we were trying to decide what we were gonna do about that. Um, the winter after the fire, there had been some seeding that took place. We didn't want to set um, that effort back and the terrain is really rocky and steep and difficult to get into. I think that herbicides do have their place, but it would have been really tough to get in there with herbicides and we'd already lined up some goats to come out and work on another project. So we decided to try the goats on this 33 acre um, section of BLM uh, really close to town. So I love this picture with a firefighter. There's not much water on the site, and so our, um, one of our engine crews brought water out every few days to refill the goats' water troughs. And Lonnie always 
um, brags that she has figured out a way to irrigate uphill. And the way she irrigates uphill is she has a bunch of goats and they drink a lot of water and then they walk uphill and then they spread that water with the addition of some nitrogen and, and some other things mixed in as well. And so while the goats were eating the, weed, the weeds all through this really rocky terrain, um, they were also irrigating. They were spreading some nitrogen around. They were um, working the soil surface, aerating the soil, and um, they were leaving nice organic natural fertilizer every there, everywhere they went as well. And we're working that in with their hooves also. Um, I mentioned that goats are browsers, so they loved this re-sprouting gamble oak, and that was fine. They weren't gonna hurt the gamble oak, but they ate the majority of the weeds on that site. We did not bring them back, so that was in 2019, wait, we saw the weed infestation in 2019. We had the goats there in 2020. We did not bring them back last summer, but we're planning to bring them back this year because anybody who's tried to manage weeds knows you're not gonna take care of a whole weed infestation in one year. It's an ongoing process and you knock it back a little bit each year. But we're excited that we're gonna be bringing them out again. So this is a new project I'm excited about. Light Hill is in the Roaring Fork Valley. Um, this map shows, it's, it's a planning map from a project that was done several years ago. So the red polygon was a prescribed burn that BLM conducted and the big blue polygon was a mechanical treatment. So we did the prescribed burn along the ridge that um, I photographed last summer um, to create a fire break between private and public land, and also to open up that slope. Um, you guys are probably aware, in a lot of cases where you have really dense gamble oak and serviceberry and other shrubs, it can reach a point where it's impenetrable to large animals, and all the nutritious new growth is up really high out of the reach beyond the brow zone of deer and elk and other animals that can't climb or fly. And so, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife had really uh, supported opening that area up, encouraging some sprouting from those shrubs, increasing palatability, uh, nutrition, and accessibility to the site. Uh, last winter, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife contacted us and said, oh my gosh, we'd really like you guys to maintain these treatments because uh, these shrubs grow back really quickly and they felt that um, the benefit of those treatments is starting to wane. So. One of our quandaries is, um, given the ongoing drought conditions, we're really concerned about doing a prescribed burn that close to private land. And we might be able to find a burn window, but it's, uh, it may be difficult to find the perfect opportunity to burn there. That terrain is way too steep for heavy equipment. So we were trying to decide how, what the best method would be for maintaining it. And we started thinking, well, it might be interesting to bring goats out and see what they could do there. So uh, we took uh, Lonnie and her son, Donnie, who run Goat Green LLC, out to take a look at it. And they think that they can um, make a difference in there. It's gonna be really challenging with the steepness and uh, all the brush, but but we're gonna try it. And I think it's gonna be a really good alternative to waiting and waiting maybe years before we had a burn window. Um, I think we're gonna need to bring heavy equipment into that uh, mechanical treatment because it's so vast, but um, we might try goats in there a little bit and just see what kind of result we get. Um, Christy Walner is one of our rangeland management specialists. She's a real think outside the box person. And she um, is doing this 50 acre pilot project in the Roaring Fork Valley where she's wanting to use the goats to encourage the growth form of gamble oak. You know, sometimes gamble oak is just really brushy and you can't even fight your way through. And sometimes it takes more of this growth form of, I call it like a, a, a savanna, type stand of gamble oak where they're, they're more individual stems where it looks more like a tree. And so the goats will get up, you can see in that picture on the right, up on their hind legs, some of the males can reach up to eight feet high and they'll clear, they um, clear off all the shoots and the smaller branches. And we wanna see if we can encourage that more savanna stand type growth form, which does provide a lot of good 
uh, thermal and hiding cover and open up the understory a little bit to hopefully get an increase in grasses and forbs and also some sagebrush. So this is a small trial project. We're gonna see how it works. Uh, we've got one year that we've completed so far. So I wanna spend most of the time this evening talking about the work we're doing at Shooty Ranch. Um, who here has been to Shooty Ranch? Yay! Almost everybody. Um, it's a really special place. If you haven't been there, been there yet, it's between Glenwood and Carbondale, and um, it's, it's very accessible. It's a beautiful spot. BLM acquired it in 2017 through a land exchange. Um, it's a 557-acre property. The, uh, the site was homesteaded around 1909, and it has a really rich ranching history. Um, the Shooty family ranched there for many, many years. Did anybody here know the Shooties? There are people in the valley who, who remember the Shooty brothers. And, um, and then there were some other people that managed it for a few years. So it was basically ranched from 1909 until the BLM obtained it through the land exchange. Um, it provides really important mule deer and elk winter range. Um, it includes about 80 acres of former agricultural fields. Uh, one of the first things we did when it came under BLM management was we developed a management plan for the property. People here might have been involved with that process. The alternative that we selected um, emphasizes management for wildlife habitat in balance with some recreation opportunities. So uh, we've developed a big parking lot for horse trailers. We've got another parking lot for individual vehicles. Um, people love to go out and walk and run and walk their dogs. Lots of people like to ride horses there. We completed a mountain bike trail that connects with the Red Hill Trail system last summer. Um, one thing I would like to point out about dogs, if you take dogs, I would really encourage you to keep them on a leash or really close to you. Um, I see people letting their dogs run through the fields all the time. It's not a dog park. We're trying to manage it for wildlife and we could do all the habitat improvement projects in those fields. And um, if dogs are running through all the, all the time, uh, wildlife aren't gonna use the fields. Where there, um, there's a really nice dog park in Carbondale. So I just always like to remind people of that. I think one of the very best things that we're doing for wildlife is the winter closure that's in place. The entire property is closed to all human activity from Defe December 1st until April 15th. And the mountain bike trail is open for a smaller window than other uses. So the mountain bike trail is open from January 1st until September 30th. So after, so, you know, the first thing we did was we established the winter closure. Um, as the wildlife biologist, another priority for me was to remove a lot of the livestock fencing on the property. So we are not managing it as a traditional uh, livestock grazing allotment. And so we didn't need all the fences. So the summer of 2020, we had a two week Rocky Mountain Youth Corps crew out. That's who's pictured in the top row of photographs. We had some really enthusiastic high school students who removed literally tons of wire. Um, and then Wilderness Workshop hosted a National Public Lands Day event that fall. So the picture in the lower right uh, is showing some of the really great volunteers who came out and helped us clean up some additional fence. Last summer, the Roaring Fork Valley Horse Council funded another Youth Corps crew that spent several days at Sudi. At this point, we've removed over four miles of fence, which I am really proud of. There's still some little sections of fence here and there. Um, and as we have folks who are available and ready and willing to help with that, we'll try to get the rest of it out. Um, we did leave two strands of wire fence as you uh, walk along the road as you enter the property, and that's just to encourage walkers and hikers to stay on the road and out of the fields. Um, but by removing the top and the bottom wires, it's a lot easier for animals to move through. And what you may or may not have noticed, depending on how much time you spent there, there used to be fences around the backside of all of those fields. And so that was a, a really solid barrier between the woodlands where the hiding and thermal cover is and the fields where animals like to come out and feed. And I love that now it's really easy for animals to move back and forth. Um, another project I wanted to mention, we've partnered with Roaring Fork Audubon and they've done bird surveys on the property for us. And they had, I think the really great suggestion of installing 
installing bluebird nesting boxes. And so they've had the lead on that project. They have installed boxes, they're monitoring them. Um, if they have reason to move them to other locations, they're gonna be in charge of that. But if you spent much time out there in the summer, you may have noticed the mountain bluebirds using the fields. Um, it's a great place to watch bluebirds and other species of birds too. Let me get this. So this is an aerial view of those 80 acres of agricultural fields that I mentioned. So this photo predates the parking lot. So the parking lot's around here, and then most people walk along the road um, onto the property. And so my second main goal, besides I, removing the fences, was I we were talking about the potential for increasing the diversity of the plants growing in those fields. So this is what they look like now. I took the center picture last spring so the grass hadn't gotten very tall yet, but the fields are dominated by smooth brome and crested wheatgrass. That's smooth brome on the left, crested wheatgrass on the right. And those are fine agricultural grasses. They're not native to the United States, but they were, uh, smooth brome was introduced in the late 1800s. Um, crested wheat was brought here around the 1930s from Russia. These species occur across much of North America at this point, and they provide a lot of forage value for livestock. Um, for wildlife, maybe not quite as much. Uh, deer and elk are definitely in the fields. Elk eat the grasses in the winter, and we see deer and elk grazing on them in the spring when the grasses are green. But um, there's just not very much diversity out there right now. It's pretty much a monoculture. There are a few weeds and a few other things mixed in, but it's pretty much these two species of grasses that have the tendency to take over like this um, and exclude native plants, and they also have the tendency uh, to spread beyond where they've been planted. Let's see. So, I always like to look to nature um, when I'm thinking about how to manage a landscape, and nature tends to move towards diversity, right? And so these are photos from other parts of the field office, to be fair, a little bit higher elevation. But if you go to an area that hasn't been managed specifically for livestock, you would typically expect to see a variety of grasses, right? You would see grasses that green up in the spring, and you would see grasses that uh, green up in the middle of the summer. You would see bunch grasses, and you would see bunch grasses that spread underground by their rhizomes. You would see a wide variety of wildflowers. If you visit a spot in June, July, and August, you would expect to see different wildflowers blooming during each of those months. The flowers are attracting pollinators. All these different plant species are supporting um, a much more diverse group of insects, which then supports a more diverse group of vertebrates. Um, and the soils are probably a lot healthier and you probably have a more complex and more thriving soil ecosystem in places like this versus the monoculture in the fields right now. And you know that made perfect sense when they were being managed for livestock. Um, but now that we've shifted our management towards wildlife, I'd really like to see more diversity. So how do you do that? How do you move from that picture of the monoculture to these pictures? Well, the conventional method looks something like this. So we were advised if we want to get rid of these grasses because they're so pervasive and have such extensive root systems that we should go in with heavy equipment and till the soil to break up the roots and then we should spray herbicide and not just spray herbicide but maybe every 10 days or so hit it with Roundup or something comparable. And so, yeah, you can probably get rid of the grasses doing that, but at what cost, right? That's not the approach that we wanna take. I can't think of anything in nature that would mirror what um, that heavy equipment is doing out there. The last thing we wanna do is disrupt the soil like that. We want to be rebuilding our soils, not disturbing them like that. So, so we spent a lot of time really wondering, well, what method could we use? Because we knew if we just went out and seeded, the seeds wouldn't have a chance to compete with the grasses that are there right now. And um, this woman, Christy Wallner, that I mentioned, uh, took a really great restorative agriculture class and came back with some fantastic ideas. And we started talking about using high intensity, short duration, 
goat grazing to help us achieve this objective. Um, we reached out to Lonnie Malberg because we knew she had experience doing all types of restoration work with her goats. We invited her out. She took a look at the landscape and she thought that she could help us. Um, so I want to just tell you a little bit about the way her operation works because I think a lot of times when people picture, oh, goat grazing, you think, oh, they've just let the goats out to wander for the whole summer. This is actually a really controlled and highly managed operation. So in the picture on the left, you can see some of her temporary fencing. The way she manages her goats is she'll set up temporary fencing in a pen and she puts all the goats in there. And I'm talking a lot of goats. The first year she brought 1,200 goats. Last year she brought about 800 goats. So we're talking high intensity grazing. Um, but that's what we want to do. We want to overgraze it because we want to knock back these undesirable grasses. So she's got them in the pen and then she's got control over how long they're in the pen, right? So it might be six hours, it might be four hours, it might be eight hours. It depends how big the pen is, how many goats there are, how much there is to eat, but she keeps an eye on that. And while they're in this pen, they're setting up temporary fencing right next to it. And when they've eaten the right amount, they move them to the next pen and so on and so forth and move very systematically she moves her pens of groats across each of the fields and it, i think she was out there a little over two weeks last year i think she was there a little bit longer the week uh, the year before um, she uses highly trained herding dogs it's really fun to watch her work with the dogs um, she's worked with these dogs for their whole lives um, they know what she expects of them and vice versa. Um, she breeds her goats uh, to a large part for behavior. Um, she wants them to be a little wild but not too wild and um, she, she says she has an understanding with them. Like I said with the dogs, they know what's expected of them and, she, and, and vice versa. Um, a lot of times people ask about, well, is she attracting predators to an area? And, and she really has not had that experience. Uh, we're not aware of any predation um, when she's been working on us across the course of a year. Sometimes she'll lose a few animals to lions um, and she considers that a tax she pays on the land. But because it's so controlled and because humans are there most of the time and dogs are there most of the time, um, she really doesn't have a problem with attracting predators. Um, I was trying to think what else I was gonna say there. Okay, so this is the same aerial view, but um, the hash mark areas are our ungrazed controls. So we decided before we embarked on this restoration journey that we wanted to have um, the ability to compare grazed and ungrazed areas. So we established the controls before we brought the goats out the first time. The green dots are, um, are paired vegetation plots. So every year we are um, putting out transects and measuring vegetation and bare ground along the line. So we'll have data um, about vegetation over time. And then this last year was the first year we collected soil samples from each of those, um, kind of from the vicinity of each of those points, and then that reference site further out to the west. So as you can see, that area has been impacted. Um, it's not in its natural condition, but that's outside of the irrigated fields. Excuse me. So the first year we grazed um, all the fields and we brought the goats out in the spring because that's just how the timing worked. Um, but when we were looking at the second year, we really didn't want to have goats out in the spring during the nesting season. We know that there are ground nesting birds out there and we don't want to disrupt that. So we decided that we would rather bring the goats out late summer, early fall. Last year they arrived on September 15th um, and we want to stick with that timing. Um, but because we brought them in the fall and because we know that elk um, graze those fields in the winter, we didn't want to, um, and there wouldn't be time for those grasses to really regenerate, we decided to just treat half the fields. So last year we treated the three fields to the north of the road, and this year we're planning to treat the three fields to the south of the road, and we plan to just alternate moving forward. Um, what I forgot to mention is the first year we did seed all the fields ahead of the goats. 
Um, we were, although I would have loved to have seeded native species, we were afraid the natives wouldn't have a chance of competing with the grasses. So we consulted with Colorado Parks and Wildlife because they have a lot of experience uh, managing the state wildlife areas, and they've had really high success with um, alfalfa and sanfoin and small burnet. So we planted a mixture of those three species. So two of them are nitrogen fixers. They all have blooms for pollinators and um, the small burnet is in the rose family and it puts out some really nice seeds for small mammals and birds in the fall. Um, we were really hoping after that first year that we'd get some good rainfall in the summer and see a lot of germination last summer and unfortunately we didn't. We saw a little bit of germination, not as much as we had hoped. So last summer we decided to just seed Ladak alfalfa, which is a very drought tolerant alfalfa and that was highly recommended to us as probably having about the best chance. But those other species should still be in the soil. Um, hopefully just waiting for a really good winter. It's snowing right now, right? Fingers are crossed. Um, we'll see we're planning to see you know we're this is a work in progress so we're gonna see what kind of germination we get in the spring and we'll decide um, what we're gonna seed this next year kind of based on the results that we see okay I am not a soil scientist and I'm not gonna get not gonna get into a lot of detail with the soil work that we're doing, but I have these graphs here to illustrate that we are starting to monitor soils. Um, we're monitoring organic matter and soil respiration. So of course the organic matter is what the um, microbes in the soil are using and respiration. So most microbes uh, release carbon dioxide like we do and so um, if you can measure the amount of carbon dioxide in a soil sample that is an index of uh, microbial activity um, and of course the more microbial activity you have the more soil health you have so this is not a comparison this is just our baseline um, I think it's going to be more meaningful in time and I'll be really interested to see if we do eventually see some differences between grazed and ungrazed um, you might notice that the values for the reference site are quite low which in some ways is surprising but what we think is happening is because um, those other fields were irrigated for such a long time that's probably why there's more organic matter there and why there probably are more microbes in the soil so I think like I said the really interesting thing is going to be to see if there are eventually differences between grazed and ungrazed but there's not much of a pattern there yet if you're a gardener you're familiar with uh, nitrogen phosphorus and potassium we're also monitoring several other soil nutrients but um, these are some of the really important ones um, so this is a picture that Lonnie sent us that she took about two months after the goats uh, first arrived at Sudi last year and that brown patch is our ungrazed control. So we got feedback from a lot of people who, you know, a lot of people are really excited about the project, but some people have expressed concerns because they're like, what the, what the heck is the BLM doing? You're overgrazing the fields. And so um, we're doing that on purpose, but we're doing it with um, a vision in mind and I love this picture because it shows that things are green after the treatment. We're not, um, we're never gonna get rid of all those grasses. We're hoping to knock them back to make room for other species and increase the diversity. But I think it's pretty telling that um, things were greener in the, in the grazed areas than they were in our ungrazed control. Um, we set up some stations last year. If you've been out there, maybe you've noticed this is a citizen science monitoring project that I'm really excited about. So there are three spots along the road. Um, I would invite you to participate in this. So all you need to go do is go up to the fence post where the sign is. I always take a picture of the sign and then there's a 3D printed bracket on top that your phone fits on and um, snap a picture and the hardest part is remembering when you get back to cell service to download it but you can follow the instructions on the picture and the pictures get uploaded to a public facing website and my hope is if we can get a lot of people participating that we'll be able to get a time lapse record through the growing season and from year to year so the three spots were set up in to take pictures of the three fields with controls so within that 
um, picture frame, you can see some of the grazed and ungrazed areas. So um, anyway, I hope I hope you'll help us with monitoring our process, our process, our progress here. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to um, some really great groups who have helped us with our wildlife habitat work at SUDI, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Wilderness Workshop, Roaring Fork Valley Horse Council, Roaring Fork Audubon, Rocky Mountain Youth Corps, the NRCS, and of course Goat Green LLC, who has been our contractor the last two years. That's her website. Um, if you wanna go there and get some additional information, there's a tab on the homepage for uh, press and she's got a lot of interesting articles and there's a really great episode of a farm to fork Wyoming television episode that was filmed a couple of years ago. They interview Lonnie and um, another couple who has another business that does similar types of work. I found it to be really inspiring. Um, and I talked really fast, sorry about that, but we've got, we've got plenty of time for questions, if people have questions, and I also have a couple other things I can talk about too, if not, yes. Um, that was really great, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Oh. This mic just so get up on it. Okay, um, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, participated in the um, RFOV and RF IMBA, RF MBA, um, trail uh, construction out there for a couple oh, of days, which is just fantastic. Um, and uh, so I, I guess I'm wondering um, why the uh, closure uh, the, to mountain bikes is more restrictive than the, uh, than the rest of the property. Yes, so that's a great question, and thank you for your help. And I, I didn't acknowledge all the fantastic volunteer hours that went into um, constructing that trail, I think, because the focus was more on wildlife habitat, sure. but thank you. Yeah, well, so all types of recreation, of course, have different impacts to wildlife, and because that trail goes through and around the fields, and because we're trying to be really sensitive to what's happening in the fields, that's the reason for that. Um, we know from Colorado Parks and Wildlife that at least before we started getting um, large amounts of visitation, that um, several mule deer fawns were born on the property every spring. I suspect that they still are. They're maybe just back in the woodlands a little bit more. And because um, that's such a fun, winding, circuitous route, we feel we have felt that we would like to just give a little more of a break for wildlife on the shoulder season a little bit. So that's why. So we felt like, okay, we're still giving hopefully a really good window. And also um, we would expect by, by June 1st that the trail would be really dry. You know, I'm not worried about the road. It's a very established road, but we wanna take really good care of that trail because a lot of hard work went into building it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, it, 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 are you planting native species? I mean, alfalfa is not a... So we have not planted native species and very intentionally because we're concerned that the native species aren't going to have a chance to outcompete these grasses. We hope with time that we can transition to more native species, something that I may have forgotten to mention when I was talking about this three species that we selected that were recommended by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Those are three plants that are highly palatable and are more nutritious for deer and elk and other animals than those um, the current Crested grasses are. Grass, I know is what all the ranchers plant for their because cattle. Because it has a really high value for livestock. But the, um, the literature shows it that- doesn't, other, It doesn't work for wildlife, not even in the winter. Well, I'm, I always defer to Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm talking about crested wheatgrass. Oh, right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, I meant the plants that we're hoping to um, introduce to the field. Right, yeah. and I, 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 I saw a study they did in Nevada because the crested wheatgrass is everywhere and they tried to return it to native. Mm -hmm. They spent three years and they used a lot of chemicals to boot. Could not do it, they quit. So it's a, crested wheatgrass is a highly invasive species. And I know BLM plants it all over for livestock. Once upon a time we did. Um, we don't anymore, but you yeah, don't? that Since has when? been done. Since when? 
Well, we don't in our field office, so I can speak for projects I've been involved with and I have not planted it because I'm concerned about the invasive nature of it. But um, but you're right. It's, yeah, it's, it could not get rid, it could not return it. And that's the thing is when you do deforestation of sage and pinion and juniper, that is essential wildlife uh, habitat and it gives shade to the land and you take that off and you know if you're protecting the sage grass I mean they don't call them sage grass for nothing so this deforestation to make bigger feedlots for livestock on our public lands is disastrous it's disastrous now I saw the shooty I lived next to shooty ranch mm -hmm. for 18 years you know that so uh, I saw the first year you brought the goats in and you already had done something to the land and I could see that you seeded it. Was that mechanical? So all we did prior to the goats coming was we drove, we did some of it by hand, but we drove UTVs back and forth across the fields with a seeder on the back. So we spread that mixture of three seeds before the goats the first year and then the second year we seeded the late alfalfa the same way. Well, I mean, it was compl I have pictures of it all. It was completely decertified. Once you put the goats on there, I mean, there wasn't a scrap of feed. So you've got wildlife coming in for the winter, and they have no food. And I thought that was later in the year that when did you do The it? first year was the spring, and then, well, early summer. And then last year, the goats arrived on September 15th. Um, and then that's, um, so I hope you got the message that what we're trying to work towards is away from this monoculture and towards a more diverse system. And yeah, we, know it's not, we know it's not gonna happen overnight. The fields were in agriculture for over 100 years and all of a sudden we decided to change um, the way we're managing them. If we went in with heavy equipment and herbicide, yeah, we would see a change really fast, but in the absence of um, reliable water, I think we'd end up with a weed patch which would be worse than what we have now. And so um, we probably won't ever completely get rid of those grasses, but what we're working towards is to reduce the grasses so that we can create some spaces for other plants that we think have a chance to compete with them to grow and thrive. We're working towards rebuilding soils through the action of the goats. And as we, if we can establish some of these other species and um, get more plant diversity, we think that is gonna contribute to increasing the um, soil ecology as well. And something, I don't know if you noticed last summer or not, but I'm really excited about, um, that first field you come to by the old house, there was a big growth of Western wheatgrass, which we had not seen there prior to that. There used to be a patch of white top, which is a noxious weed and it's a highly disturbed area. And last year we saw a lot of Western wheatgrass. I was so excited. And when Ian managed the property, he seeded, he spread some seeds out there and we that think that's where it came from. pretty good, the first field. But you know, I noticed when the goats graze on the highways, which I think it's a great thing, um, they pull everything out. I mean, it's down to just the, I mean, they pull everything out. And if they're doing that to, I mean, that place was decertified. And the Shooty Ranch was one of the most gorgeous green places before. So if you get it down to that kind of decertification, that's when the invasive weeds come in because it's bare earth. And you got the, the um, cheat grass, is, which is all over the West. That's how cheat grass takes hold. That's how I'm a gardener. I'm a landscape mm -hmm. gardener. If you got bare earth, all the weeds come and, and they sit down. And you're not watering, you're not running the irrigation. So, how do you expect to grow seed? Spend all that money doing what you do, and how do you expect to grow seed if you're not running the ditches? I do, I do want to offer other folks the opportunity to ask questions, so let's keep our questions to one per person. Right, and I'm happy to, I'm happy to visit more please. later. I have some very important questions about this. Okay. I'm going to make sure everybody has the opportunity to contribute. Can you answer that question though before I pass it on? So, the question, so. If we're able to um, 
rebuild the soils, which is what we're trying to do. We're hoping to increase their water holding capacity, which in um, with global warming and with ongoing drought, we think that um, that should increase the ability of the soil to hold water and support plants. And we think that, um, so I know from your perspective, you're seeing that those fields are bare when the goats are done. What, what, I, what, I, see, what I see is a nice mulch of little pieces of grass that are partially churned into the soil where they're gonna break down. And I see that layer of grass that's protecting the soil surface. And I'm seeing regeneration and I'm seeing, I'm seeing more green in the area that was treated than in the control. And um, I'm really excited about the Western wheatgrass. One of the fields on the north side, I walked through there the day before the goat showed up and I saw a lot of globe mallow, which I had not seen in the field previously and globe mallow is a fantastic native plant with a lot of value to a wide variety of species and I think that um, I don't have any reason to think that what we've done has set us back and I think that we're on a path forward we're learning as we go that's why we're doing all this monitoring that's why we have the vegetation plots that's why we started the soil monitoring if at any point we think we're doing something harmful we will reassess but i want to give this a few more years and i feel like we already saw some benefits last year and i think we're going to see some this year but i think we need to be patient i suspect around the five-year mark we may see more i think at the 10-year mark we might say more but we won't know if we try and and we know that what we have right now was great for livestock but it has um, a lot more potential. It had limited value for wildlife. It definitely has value for wildlife, for sure. But I think that we could improve the value for wildlife if we can increase the diversity of plants in those fields. I would love to see flowers for pollinators. There I used would. Used to be flowers there. Yeah. Well. You know, Shudi didn't. Another question. Here, I, I can pass it. Well, it's close. I have one question and an okay, encouragement. One question. One first. question. <laughs> Uh, are there uh, test plots for the native grass planting? So we have not planted, we, BLM yeah. has not planted when, native grasses. When that gets planted? Oh, that's absolutely. If, at some point, as, as we, as we um, change our management, we want to be monitoring that. So right now we're on the path where we're planning to graze half the fields each year. So there's still some forage there in the winter and we're going to continue um, planting the seeds that have been recommended to us by a variety of sources um, and we're going to pivot with time we're going to have to kind of play this by ear a little bit and be you know reactive to what the response is but um, when we reach the point where we can be seeding natives then we will definitely study that but in this area where we've got uh, where the western wheat came up last summer um, we're definitely going to keep an eye on that. Um, we didn't measure, I guess we didn't measure the extent of that patch. Um, you know, that might be something we think about doing this year. I sure remember where it was. I'm excited to see if it comes back. Lonnie thinks we're going to see it coming back um, with more prevalence another year, especially if um, we can be improving soil conditions. So time will tell. So I have an encouragement is that you would use the data from uh, you're beginning to collect now forward yes, and and how it's being newly managed yes And then after a period it could even be a short period three to four years go back the other way and looking at How what took place here with the management that was in the past? Mm -hmm. And how dramatically different that's going to be than cattle Yeah Thanks. Hi, Hillary. It's good to Hi, see you. It's good to see you. Um, <laughs> last summer, we did some restoration and work on the silt preserve. Yes. And so I was just wondering does the BLM, are you working collaboratively with the town of Silt on that project as well? Because it seems like the goats would be a perfect fit out there. Lots of cheat grass, lots of um, 
invasive grasses and such a beautiful piece of property. That is a beautiful piece of property. Um, so we don't really have any jurisdiction beyond our boundaries, but we're always available to answer questions if people, you know, want to call. I guess I haven't um, had an opportunity to interact with those folks a whole lot. I've volunteered some, mm -hmm. and um, and I've actually had that thought that it that landscape might benefit from some timed goat grazing. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there, but but yeah, I mean we're our our um, the team I work on our focus is really on um, you know the specific lands that we manage. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Thank you for doing this. Just in general, um, my question was: as you increase the diversity of plant life on those fields, how do you find the balance where the goats aren't actually decreasing that diversity when they come in to do their grazing? Exactly, that's a concern of mine and that's something that we're gonna have to kind of play by ear. I think that's a long ways off. My hope is that we're gonna get to a point where we don't need the goats anymore, right? That um, we're gonna achieve a level of diversity that we think is sustainable and that we won't need to do this. I mean, we're not gonna be able to do this forever. So, um, so yeah, that is definitely something that we are keeping in mind as we move forward. But I think that's a few years out. Yeah. Probably have time for one more question. <laughs> Why not? Uh, so um, you, I know this is a in partnership in with the Audubon Society, but um, if you could speak a little bit to like if any of the monitoring of the bluebird boxes like what you know about kind of how that project is going or like other just like in general the ground nesting birds and the um that the like impact on the bird wildlife yeah so they've done um a big reason i reached out to them was i knew that i didn't have the capacity to go out and do some baseline monitoring and so they have created a species list for us and so, um, but not necessarily like numbers and density of birds. So we won't really be able to use that data to detect any um, differences in abundance over time. But I think we will be able to detect if we see any changes in species. What was interesting to me with the, the bluebird boxes, because I hadn't personally installed a lot of bluebird boxes before, the reason they're installed in pairs is because um, Swallows, we have tree swallows and violet green swallows out there and they can be pretty aggressive and sometimes they'll kick a bluebird out of a box. And so the idea with the paired boxes is if um, a pair of swallows move into one, they're not gonna chase bluebirds off. So then the bluebirds might be safe next door. Um, so that's the reason they're paired like that. And when they monitored the boxes, I think they did find evidence that maybe um, a bluebird nest had been nested over by a swallow um, and I can't remember off the top of my head it was the first season so there were there some of the boxes were used not all of the boxes were used and they aren't really sure like if it was a good amount or not I mean it's kind of hard to say but we're excited that some were used and then you know they have the ability um, they're each of the boxes is numbered and so over time if they're finding that some just aren't being used they can move them um, it's a little bit of an experiment most of the boxes are geared more towards bluebirds and they're on fence posts by the fields but they also installed some boxes back in the trees uh, more for house wrens and chickadees and I'm pretty sure they did have a wren nest in one of the boxes I can't remember for sure, sorry. But they did have some success with them, which is exciting. And it'll be fun to see over time mm -hmm. if, if they're used more. I don't know how long it takes for, for birds to, to find and start using nest boxes like that. Yeah. Just a comment that um, I love the uh, citizen science thing with the, um, the, cam the, yeah. you know, the iPhone, because who doesn't have their phone right. and just take pictures and then having it set up, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. I think for us, it's a matter of starting to spread the word. We haven't done a very good job yet of letting people know about that. But yeah, I really hope people will participate because I think that's going to be really telling over time. Yeah, thanks.
Awesome. Well, let's give it up for Hillary. She did such a fantastic job tonight. Thank you all so much for coming and braving the snowy roads to be here with us tonight. Um, on your way out, if there are extra cookies left, grab some. Um, we also have some wilderness workshop swag in the back. Our next naturalist night, as a reminder, will be March 9th and it will be three billion birds will be the topic. So I encourage you all to come by in two weeks. Thank you so much, have a great night.